This tutorial will show you how to use Cytoscape to visualize sequence relationships in large groups of related enzymes using sequence similarity networks downloaded from the Structure Function Linkage Database. If you're not familiar with the SFLD, you might start by watching our introductory SFLD tutorial. Cytoscape allows you to explore networks, such as sequence similarity networks, interactively in real time. As I hope you'll see, this interactive exploration is quite helpful in terms of developing hypotheses about structure-function relationships in enzyme superfamilies. In our tutorial today, I'll start with a brief introduction to sequence similarity networks in Cytoscape, then show you how you might use sequence similarity networks to make some hypotheses about the function of an uncharacterized enzyme. You can download Cytoscape networks for any SFLD subgroup or family. For today's example, I'm going to use the PLP-dependent subgroup from the Radical SAM superfamily. In this middle section, I'm going to choose the Download Network tab. The sequence similarity networks in the SFLD are created using BLAST as a sequence similarity metric, so you can choose the BLAST e-value cutoff for the network you download. The ideal value will depend on the group you're looking at and the questions you're asking. Since I don't want a huge network that's going to take a lot of time to download and open, I'm going to choose a more stringent cutoff than the default. And then click the Download Network button. You must have the Cytoscape program installed on your computer to open the networks you download from the SFLD, but it's free and you can download it by clicking the download link on the Cytoscape homepage. I'm going to start the Cytoscape program and then import the network that I just downloaded. I go to File, Import, Network, and choose the file that I downloaded from the SFLD. When the network first opens, I have a very uninformative view. So the first thing I want to do is to lay the network out. There are many different layouts built into Cytoscape, and you can play around with them to see what you like best. One that we particularly like is the Y-Files organic layout. Depending on the size of your network, layout may take a while. Each of these squares, or nodes, that you see represents a single sequence in the PLP-dependent subgroup. And each of the lines, or edges, represents a BLAST connection at least as significant as the e-value cutoff I specified. Sequences are colored according to their SFLD family, and you can see that sequences in the same family roughly cluster together. In this layout, the edges between sequences only represent connectivity. That is, they show that two nodes are connected at the specified e-value cutoff. But while the lengths of these edges don't directly represent how distant the proteins are from each other, they give a pretty good indirect approximation. Clicking on a node selects that sequence. You'll see it highlighted in yellow on the network. And you'll also see it down here in the data panel. Sequences are also associated with annotation information, which is pulled over from the SFLD. I'm only going to go over some of the available annotation information now, but you can access a comprehensive list of all the available uh, node attributes and their definitions on the SFLD page where you downloaded the network. Now I'm going to choose a few attributes that I think are the most interesting, just to show you as examples. The attributes are shown down here in the data panel. This DNA available column shows you whether or not New York Structural Genomics has DNA available to clone the sequence, so that's useful if you're looking for sequences to look at in more detail via experiment. The family column lists the SFLD family designation, and related to that, 
the Family Evidence Code column tells you what kind of evidence was used to assign the sequence to the family. The IEA Evidence Code, which stands for Inferred from Electronic Annotation, is given to sequences that are assigned to a family by automated scripts based on their sequence similarity and conservation of family-specific catalytic residues. So that tends to be the least reliable classification. Sequences with the ISS Evidence Code, which stands for Inferred from Sequence Similarity, have been assigned to a family by a human curator, so they tend to be more reliable. And we also have evidence codes that indicate that sequences have been assigned to a family based on experimental information. So those are the most reliable classifications. The SFLD website has a page that lists all the evidence codes and their definitions. So you can get more information about evidence codes there. We have two columns here for length. Length domain gives you the length of that portion of the sequence thought to be part of the radical SAM superfamily, and length full gives you the length of the full sequence. So looking at this domain length can be particularly useful if you have a multi-domain protein where one domain is part of the radical SAM superfamily and one domain is part of a different superfamily. But keep in mind that the domain length is assigned by automated scripts, so it's not always completely accurate. We also have species listed here, and then a more general category that we call type of life, which can be useful if you're interested in enzymes from a particular taxonomic classification. And you can sort by any of these columns you're interested in by clicking on the header. One of the great features of Cytoscape is that you can color the network according to any of the annotation information you're interested in. So, for example, instead of coloring this network according to SFLD family classification, I could instead color according to the type of life classification of each node. So I'll show you how to do that now. I'm going to click on this arrow here to open up the Viz Mapper, and then I'm going to create a new visual style where I color by type of life. The coloring in the network will disappear and I can change the appearance of the network according to any of these properties listed here. I think node color is probably the easiest to see so that's what I'm going to choose by double clicking on the box next to node color. I'm going to choose a discrete mapper which means I'll have a separate color for each value of the attribute. And the attribute I'm coloring by is type of life. I can manually set the color for each of these values by clicking in this box and choosing a color from the palette. But in the interest of time, I'm going to have Cytoscape choose the colors for me. I right click on this node color box and then select one of these color schemes. Notice that there are some white nodes which are kind of hard to see because they blend in with the background. These are nodes that don't have a value for this type of life attribute. I can change their color by changing the default node color by clicking in this defaults box here and choosing node fill color. So I'm going to set that to gray and click the apply button and now those are a little easier to see. So as you can see here, the vast majority of the sequences in this group are cyan, uh, meaning that they're bacterial, and we have smaller numbers from the other taxonomic categories. So coloring by type of life was a really fast, easy way to get an idea of the distribution of organisms in this sequence set. So that's a very brief introduction to Cytoscape. Now let's look at how we might use the program to make some hypotheses regarding the function of an uncharacterized enzyme. This is the NCBI GenPept page for an enzyme annotated as L-lysine 23 amino mutase. But if I scroll down to the reference section here, you can see that these references are all large-scale sequencing papers, so it doesn't look like this annotation is based on experimental data. Back in our Cytoscape network, I'm going to change back to family coloring, 
and then I want to find that sequence that I just showed you in the network. There are a few different ways you can search these networks. I'm just going to show you one way to do it using filters. I go to select, use old filters, create new filter, string filter. I'm going to select nodes by their all GIs attribute. This attribute lists all the NCBI GI numbers corresponding to a given sequence. And from the NCBI page, I know the GI number of the sequence I'm looking for. So I'm going to search for that in the list here. I click the Apply button. And Cytoscape has highlighted this sequence in yellow and shown it in the data panel here. I'll just zoom in a little bit to give you a better look at the sequence. It's a little bit hard to see what the closest relatives of this sequence are because it's sort of jumbled in with this huge cluster of sequences from various families. So what I'm going to do is make a copy of the network and then filter it to a more stringent E value so we can see what the closest relatives of the sequence are. To copy the network, I go to File, New, Network, Clone Current Network, and I get a copy right here. Now I'm going to use filters again, this time to filter the less significant edges out of the network. This time I want a numeric filter and I'm going to be filtering edges based on their last E value. And I'm going to select all edges with an E value less significant than 1 times 10 to the minus 110. After this filtering process is complete, you'll see all the edges that don't meet this new cutoff highlighted in red on the network, and I'll be able to quickly delete them. To delete the edges, I go to Edit, Delete Selected Nodes and Edges. And now I'm going to lay out the network one more time using the same layout I used before. Since there are fewer edges in the network this time, it shouldn't take quite as long to lay out. And you can see that whereas before all our nodes were connected into one single cluster, now we have multiple discrete clusters. And I'm going to search for our sequence of interest one more time using the filter that I created before. Here it is highlighted in yellow. I'll zoom in on it a little bit. And you can see that now it's very easy to see what the closest related family is to our sequence of interest. I'll just highlight this family so we can see what it is. And it looks like these sequences are actually glutamate 23 amino mutases. If you'll remember, in the NCBI databases, our sequence was annotated as a lysine 23 amino mutase. The lysine 23 amino mutase family is actually right here. So it looks like, based on the network, this sequence is actually closer to glutamate 23 amino mutase. Of course, hypotheses made based on networks should always be examined in more depth. In this case, for example, we might want to look at our sequence of interest in the context of a multiple sequence alignment to the glutamate 23 amino mutase family and see if it contains the catalytic residues required for family-specific functionality. However, because these sequence networks are so flexible, fast, and easy to work with, they're a great place to start for hypothesis generation. 
This concludes our brief tutorial on using Cytoscape to visualize sequence relationships in large groups of related enzymes using sequence similarity networks downloaded from the Structure Function Linkage Database.